views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Voices of Women is a top radio show that gives voice to the personal stories of women. It will inspire women and enlighten men to follow their dreams and create positive changes in their lives. Whether the audience listens to best-selling authors or a layperson like themselves, they'll realize there are others with similar experiences and feelings to their own. This show will give women tools they can use every day, which will empower them to step out of their boxes and create the changes they desire in their life. Chris inspires women to find their voice Voices, speak up and become leaders of their own life. Everyone has their gifts to share with the world, and it's time for women to work together to bring honor and respect to the feminine voice, which is within all people, men and women. Topics include personal growth, spirituality, creativity, leadership, and divine feminine. Now here's your host, Chris Stanis. Well, welcome to Voices of Women. This is a beautiful January day. It's hard to believe that we're in 2017 and soon our conference, our Women Wisdom Conference, our 25th year, which is pretty amazing, February 16th to 20th in Seattle. And the WOW Conference offers workshops on many diverse topics, art, music, sounding, dance, women's wisdom, life purpose, relationships, healing, racism, tantric dance, shamanism, goddess wisdom. We're going to have drum making, there's ritual magic, astrology, and so much more. The list goes on. Uh, so but it's an important time for women to gather and explore the avenues for empowerment. Um, we're going to have a Seattle Women's March in January, January 21st. And so women will be looking for additional ways to step into their power, replenish their spirit. And what we do at Women Wisdom is share our stories and help each other pursue our dreams for a better world. Um, I also want to share how you can volunteer at the conference. So it's really accessible for anybody to be able to attend. We have scholarships. We have volunteers. Just check everything out at a website at womenawisdom.org. And today is a deadline for early bird um, pricing for a few of our featured guests, Lori McCammon, author of Enough, Randy Reagan, um, it's about a year of living mindfully, and Rebecca Gordon, Your Power in the Stars. She's an astrologer. So you can check out the schedule. It's all there on womenawisdom.org. And today I have, again, some great Woman Wisdom presenters. At first, we'll have Rebecca Goldsmith and Alicia Del- Delosto. They are doing a workshop called Racism and Whiteness in Our Backyard. Alicia and Rebecca are accomplished facilitators and artists who design transformative experiences that challenge and inspire people to realize their creative potential. They're part of a Seattle-based collective called In Our Backyard, That was formed in 2017 following the death of Eric Garner. So welcome, Rebecca and Alicia. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Yeah, so um, tell us your story, how you two met, why you decided to work together. Sure. This is is Rebecca. Um, uh, Alicia and I met about 10 years ago. Happy anniversary, Alicia. Thank you. Um, we met at a, yeah, <laughs> we met at a, a hard up facilitation training. It's an in, in-depth five month training program that focused on, um, facilitation, particularly using arts based and experiential practices, uh, that allowed us to understand ourselves, uh, how to design curriculum and how to build build workshops and programs that really created transformative opportunities for um, workshop participants. And yeah, that sounds like an amazing experience that you got a lot yeah. out of. And so you've been working together since in these past 10 years. Um, yeah, in a lot of different ways. This is Alicia. We've, um, we've worked with a lot of the same youth organizations, um, and I do visual art. Rebecca does a lot of vocal work, and so I've had the chance to participate in some of her vocal workshops as well as um, as a singer, and that's been really exciting to to see what Rebecca does. She's an incredible group leader and an incredible musician, so it's um, it's really fun to work with someone that I'm so inspired by. So. Oh, yes, and, and Rebecca's <laughs> going to be singing at the conference. She's going to sing, I think it's Friday night when we're opening for a speaker. And also we're doing some mo- morning gatherings before the workshops start. She's going to be 
waking us all up at nine o'clock a.m. <laughs> so yeah, excited, yeah, excited, looking, excited looking forward that. to that. Yeah. <laughs> well, so and and now you're also working in racial justice, and uh, maybe share you know why that's important to you and how that how what uh, what is our our backyard and how that got started. Yeah, sure. Uh, this is Rebecca. So um, a couple of years ago, 2014, um, we, we had a really a set of really um, disruptive, difficult, uh, shocking um, murders uh, at the hands of police and um, some jury indictments that didn't go. Uh, they they uh, Police weren't indicted. And following the death of Eric Garner and the jury indictment in 2014 that happened, that the indictment came down, or the non-indictment, I should say, um, at the end of 2014, um, a friend of mine, uh, actually a friend of ours, uh, Christina, put a challenge to white folks, basically saying, white folks, you need to start talking to each other. And that was sort of a call to action for me personally. Um, I had been feeling, I'd been long invested in racial justice, but um, had really felt quite um, uh, incapacitated. Uh, felt like there wasn't things that, there wasn't anything I could do. And when Christina kind of posed that challenge, it, it really spoke to me at a very core level. And uh, we sat together. We pulled together a group of people that we knew, uh, white people in the community who were involved and invested in racial justice um, as a way of um, taking the work deeper. And uh, and Alicia and and eight other folks in our community have we started this collaborative that we now call in our backyard, um, where we get together and we look at racial justice. Um, oh, you're, you're breaking up. I couldn't hear you. Oh, it's oh I'm again. sorry. <laughs> um, kind of chance for you said we're looking at racial justice. Ah, okay. <laughs> so we look at racial justice um, with uh, an experiential and arts-based practice, which allows us to get out of our heads and into our hearts and into our feelings and into our bodies um, in a way that makes this ex much more meaningful, much more tangible, um, and really with the goal of taking action in our community and based on the responsibility that we as white people have to undo the harmful impacts of racism in this country. Well, let's talk about some of that, the responsibility to eliminate racism. What, what is our responsibility? How do you see that? And, and what kind of steps can we take to eliminate racism? Um, yeah, this is Alicia. I'll, I'll take a stab at this one. Um, I feel like I came to, an awareness of racism relatively late in my life, and I um, I was raised in a uh, in Wisconsin in a small town outside of Milwaukee that was predominantly white, and it was really interesting to grow up never never including myself in a conversation about race. Whenever we spoke about issues of racism, even issues of diversity, I um, always kind of to that as something that was I was looking at people of color and not reflecting on myself as as a category that is also distinct and um, that's not it's not just normal <laughs> and um, so I as actually in my twenties started reading started attending lectures started really listening to um, to people of color in a in a more open way and maybe that just it was sort of taking in all this material at the same time really shifted the way um, I was thinking about it and I kind of realized that there's a lot more there's a lot more to the structure of racism than I was ever uh, challenged to think about um, in my in my life and so kind of as I'm continuing to grow older and as I'm a new parent I um, I'm committed to to waking up other <laughs> other people in my life, friends and family, and really breaking that silence and just um, to really practicing looking at our world uh, from multiple perspectives so that we can really see where all of, um, there's a lot of inequity, there's a lot of segregation in our cities, and um, there's a lot of suffering that's happening because our Social structure is set up in a way that is disadvantaging a lot of people. And we have to practice seeing that and calling it out and also 
really committing ourselves to making a meaningful change to that and one that um, it's going to be different from the way we know it. So one of the things I'm hearing is like for us white people to be uh, sub- vocal, to be to to speak about things that we see and rather than staying kind of hidden, like it's just a black person's issue. It's not, you know, because it, it relates to all of us. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Too? Uh, this is Rebecca. I would I would say yes, for sure. And I, I think that one of the ways that um, whiteness shows up for me is that I, I feel like I need to be perfect before I can speak to something. And that keeps me silent. And it keeps me disengaged and it keeps me from um, really participating in, in, a, in a way that uh, actually affects change. So for me, one of the things I consciously do is show up in places imperfect, <laughs> practice imperfection, practice being vulnerable, practice not knowing everything, but being able to at least start the conversation, interrupt, learn, listen. You know, you hear over and over again, listen. Be quiet and listen. Read. There's so much information available to us. Um, so reading and getting, becoming really aware and believing people. The experts of racism are people who are affected by racism, not white people. So we as, as white people have to really have a shift in our mindset around who, what we're valuing and what we're believing um, and be really humble about that. True. Well, and, and I think too, like being, be curious, like ask questions rather than making any assumptions as if we know what really happened. Cause like you said, we're, we're not the ones receiving, you know, that, uh, the, af- what, you know, what affects people with racism. Well, we have to take a short break now. Um, we'll come back and we'll speak more with Rebecca and Alicia. Thank you. Are you sick of feeling overworked with no motivation? Take a break from the daily grind. Life coach Nicole Eisler is here to provide a healing journey of optimism. Passionate and caring, Nicole is no ordinary soul. Her dedication to helping everyone has no limit. Witness the power of positivity. Tune in every first and third Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific for Positivity Party Radio with Nicole Eisler on Transformation Talk Radio. For more information, visit BigDreamAwakening.com. Registration is now open for the 25th Annual Woman of Wisdom Conference. Join the fabulous presenters from around the country on February 16th through the 20th. If you believe in raising the feminine spirit and transforming our world, then this conference is for you. Get your tickets now. One day and full weekend passes are available. For more information about presenters and tickets, visit womanofwisdom.org. That's womanofwisdom.org. Tune in to The Jen Royster Show, intuitive guidance to inspire your life, each Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific and 11 a.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. This amazing show is an inspirational hour that will take you on an epic metaphysical journey to discover the spiritual approach to life's greatest challenges. Dr. Jen is an internationally known intuitive counselor, spiritual teacher, and energy healer. Call in for intuitive readings and visit JenRoyster.com for more information. Beyond being this amazing neurologist, inventor, author, Dr. Dan Cohen has been called to look at technology and look at personal and spiritual development and merge these together as technology uses the healing and psycho-spiritual effects of synchronized sounds, vibrations, electromagnetic fields, and how that interacts with us in our nervous system in what we're calling the Soltech Chair. The Soltech Lounge induces profound levels of relaxation that transition over time into deep meditative states. The synchronized sound vibration and magnetic field induce these states. The subject doesn't have to work at it. To learn more, go to soltechwellbeing.com. That's S-O-L-T-E-C, well-being. Chris Stainis is a spiritual leader and healer and teaches a course on how you can transform your life through a meditation and healing system that will manifest your spirit's dreams. She manifested the Women of Wisdom Conference, the Women of Wisdom book, and this radio show. And she can show you how to change your life, too. Are you ready? Visit the website and contact her at VoicesOfWomenToday.com. That's VoicesOfWomenToday.com. Well, 
Welcome back to Voices of Women. I'm Chris Danis, and I'm with these wonderful Woman of Wisdom presenters, Rebecca Goldsmith and Alicia Del, Del Stowe, who are giving mm-hmm. a workshop on racism and whiteness in our backyard. It's going to be Sunday, February 19th. Well, before we um, go further, please share your contact information or websites where people can find out more about your work. Great. Uh, this is Rebecca. I'm at my my website is my name, Rebecca with two K's. A no H goldsmith.com. Great. And uh, mine, Alisa, is uh, Alisha Zalosto.com. It's A L I S H A D A L L O S T O.com. Great. Okay. Well, we were just talking about, uh, Rebecca, I loved that you were talking about being putting yourself in vulnerable positions and, and just, you know, being, allowing yourself to make mistakes. And we were talking at the break, we had this great conversation. I'm sorry, the audience missed out on it. It's just, you know, that awkwardness and, and we're so afraid to make a mistake, or if we say something wrong, then we're going to be, people are going to think we're a racist and, and, and we're not, we just, we, we stumble around and make mistakes and, and we're all human. So maybe share some experiences you have, have had with this and how you can overcome it. No, I can't hear uh, you. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> this is Alicia. And yeah. Um, I, yeah, I would say I've, I've made mistakes ever since I started caring about speaking up. And that, um, I think even the, it, it, I like what Rebecca said about that being afraid to speak unless you think you're, you've got it down perfect. You know exactly what you're going to say. Um, this is, we're talking about, talking about power we're talking about something that's very important and uh we're talking about other people's humanity and um and it's really and it can be very awkward to call someone out um who is making a statement you know if they're if it's a relative or a friend who said something that's really insensitive if you're witnessing something in your workplace but um, no one's saying anything uh i I think robin d'angelo um she calls it this uh it's the challenge of breaking white solidarity. And that's, that's part of it, I think. Um, and part of it is this it's really uncomfortable to stand alone, to stand for something you believe in and to stand even when you don't even know exactly how to describe what it is that's going on. And so a lot of, um, I think a lot of what we talk about in, in our backyard and a lot of the ways we try to, um, you know, practice, doing this and use these creative tools to, to kind of practice sitting with that discomfort and, and realizing that, um, you know, you're probably never going to feel that great and at ease after a conversation like this. And that that's, that's normal. That means that you're, um, you're doing something that's brave and powerful. And also it's probably not perfect and you still have a lot to learn. So you have to have an attitude of, of humility going into it also. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, and you only learn by trying. You know, you need to make the mistakes, and you learn and go. Oh, next time I'm going to say it this way. That didn't work this time. You and, know, I uh, I think of. Oh God, I'm sorry, Chris. No, go ahead. <laughs> uh, you know, it reminds me when when I first started to really consciously uh, learn. I I started. I thought about. I thought about this work as a, like a language, learning a language. And the acquisition of language comes in phases. If you're thinking about a little kid or you're thinking about moving somewhere where you are not speaking the primary language, you're, it's, it doesn't make sense to you. None of it makes sense. It doesn't even seem real. You miss out on uh, everything that people are saying. Eventually, you, might be a, you, you can be aware of tone. You can be aware of body language. But you don't really know what is going on. And then when you start, you start understanding, you start, start understanding at a very simple level, and it's still a lot of things, the nuances are going past you. Uh, eventually, you start understanding more and more, and you start forming your own words and your own sound that, that approximate the sounds that other people are making. And so eventually, you can speak very simply, and then you can speak more complexly. And that, to me, is what, what, we're, like, what understanding and being in this work is. It's, it is a process that takes time. You're not going to get it at first. I'm not going to get it. I'm still, I'm going to learn my whole life. Um, but I do think that this idea, this notion of, well, I'm not racist. So I, I, I this is, I, I, I don't want to be labeled as racist and I'm afraid. is something that really is a disservice 
to interrupting racism because, and again, I'll talk about Robin DiAngelo. She talks about the good, bad binary. And, you know, if I am racist, that is bad. Therefore I am a good person and I can't be racist. And I would just invite I, I do this myself. Try on, try on the label of racist. We work, we live in a society that benefits white people and perpetuates racism. And if I'm not consciously undoing it and interrupting it, it is happening. It's just the default that I live in. So I'm separating myself as a bad or good person from whether or not I have racist tendencies and that I benefit from racism. And that frees me up a whole lot. It's still uncomfortable. It's still awkward the way Alicia talks about it, but it also allows me to know that I'm engaged in something that matters that's really important. I mean, it's life and death in this country at this point. Yes. And you may, it makes me think when you were talking, like to really look inside of, because I think we're blind to our racism because it was so, it's so within our culture that we don't even see it, you know, for ourselves. We think we're not racist. I don't think those kinds of thoughts. And yet bringing that awareness of, of really that looking inside of any kind of um, thought or action or words that might be interpreted to other people that were, you know, it's a, it's really, it's really difficult work. It is. And it's also, it's also, um, it's a gift really when you get an opportunity to have someone um, check you or mention to you, sometimes it'll be really gracious and it'll be in a loving, lovely way that you feel really good about. And sometimes it won't. And all of it is useful. All of it's important. All of it's valid. I'd rather get the information. I'd rather learn um, than continue to do something that is harming people that I live and and, uh, share space with on this world. Yes. And I think one of the things is realizing, understanding what white privilege means. And, mm-hmm. and I, I think that's a concept that because we think in terms of, well, I'm not racist, but we don't think in terms of what does it mean to live in a culture that's white privilege and how we are, our lives are different because of that. Mm-hmm. And to really look mm-hmm. at that is, is also a self-discovery of, and how can we change that? You know, that, that's yeah. the thing we're left with. Yeah. How can we change this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think something worth noting about, um, I think us wanting to come together as as artists and bring together kind of this creative a creative mindset and a generative mindset is that we're really seeking to create something that is sustainable. We want to keep bringing each other back into this conversation, and we want to keep um, supporting each other as we go out into the world to keep trying again and trying again and and to bring in as many people as we can. And I think that. I've I've come to appreciate um, using some type of and Rebecca maybe you can speak a little bit more to the type of creative exercises that we do. But it's sometimes a combination of writing. Sometimes it's a combination of song. Um, sometimes we'll draw in on almost like theater game activities where we're having to you know, force people to bypass their you know overly intellectual mindset and and go for that immediate memory of something or a personal story, something that's um, a little bit deeper, something that really touches our heart. And those are the types of things that even when we're experiencing this discomfort while we're doing this personal reflection work, we're also stirring up what is, makes us alive and what keeps us connected to one another. And so we're kind of seeking to, to create a long lasting, a long lasting mode for, for challenging each other. Mm-hmm. And I, I love it that you bring, I, we learn so much with being creative, you know, it comes out, mm-hmm. our unconscious comes out, I think in art and writing and, and things like meditating and, and uh, making use of those tools is a great way to do this inner work that we were talking about. So um, what's, what are you inspired about now in this racial justice movement? Are you seeing changes and, uh, and seeing a movement forward? Oh, I mean, I, this is Rebecca. I'm 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 inspired by so many things uh, in in this country right now. Um, I'm deeply inspired by the Black Lives Movement, but Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I there's great work that's being done in Seattle um, around youth detention centers. Um, and arts arts and racial justice uh, inspirations. I see a lot of that in youth work that's happening. Um, young women empowered. Mm-hmm. 
FEAST, which is Food Education Empowerment Sustainability Team. Both of those are really incredible youth uh, justice organizations that combine creativity and leadership and empowerment and racial, solid racial justice foundations. Um, and just do incredible things in the community. The Office of Arts and Culture is doing incredible things right now around racial justice, combining arts um, and and really broadening the their footprint, you know, uh, in schools with the Creative Advantage Program under Lara Davis and the Turning Commitment into Action uh, Program, which is which is a way to really help develop racial equity capacity in all of the arts uh, arts uh, institutions in our city. There's just some really really great things going on just in our in our backyard, <laughs> literally in our yeah. backyard. In our backyard, <laughs> yeah, that's that's great. Well, mm-hmm. as a as mm-hmm. a parting words, what gives you hope, and what do you want to leave people with it today? Um, yeah, as a teacher, I really, right now, young people and the young people are giving me a lot of hope. And, um, also the commitment, we saw a huge, um, in the election cycle and a lot of the convert public conversation that's come out after this has been very brazenly exclusive, brazenly racist. And, um, despite what you know it really really deeply saddens me to hear uh, to hear that conversation happening but I also feel really um, I'm given hope by the the way that it's really galvanized and it's galvanized a lot of groups that have been doing amazing work for a very long time and I, I hear a lot of people who are are really gonna ready to stand up for stand up for each other and to really hold each other close and and who are envisioning a much um a much more beautiful world and i think yeah. that's hopeful yeah that's true it's um sometimes things have to hit us in the face for us to get active and we are see- we are seeing that well thank you so much for being on the show today rebecca and alicia thank you thank you Pleasure. have a great day yeah, I, mean, I look forward to having your workshop it's sunday february 19th at the woman wisdom conference uh, I'll just check out womanwisdom.org. So we're going to take a break now. We're going to come back and gonna hear from another WOW presenter, Dijeen Farrar. Join in on one of the most life-transforming adventures in personal expansion and world service. In each of our upcoming shows, you're going to have the opportunity to join thousands as we focus healing energy to elevate and balance our world. This is a chance for like-minded individuals like you and I to join forces with light workers all over the globe as we light the way for peace, harmony, and a world driven by love. You'll also learn about magical innate abilities that you can develop and use to make your dreams come true. Joy Elaine, author of The Joy Chronicles, invites you to join her and millions of others working with the Galactic Masters, Angels, and the Ashtar Command as they assist humanity and planet Earth to achieve their ultimate destination of ascension. For more information, visit joyelaine.com. That's joy, E-L-A-I-N-E.com. Chris Stainis is a spiritual leader and healer and teaches a course on how you can transform your life through a meditation and healing system that will manifest your spirit's dreams. She manifested the Women of Wisdom Conference, the Women of Wisdom book, and this radio show. And she can show you how to change your life, too. Are you ready? Visit the website and contact her at VoicesOfWomenToday.com. That's VoicesOfWomenToday.com. Are you feeling stagnant or blocked in your love life, career, health, or finances? Experiencing difficulty focusing or setting and achieving goals? Tune in to Spiritual Diagnostics Radio with psychic visionary healers Carol Dorian and Suzanne Evans. Discover the cause and effect of unwanted patterns in life. Tune in every Tuesday at 12 p.m. Pacific on Transformation Talk Radio. For more information, visit spiritualdeed.com. Registration is now open for the 25th Annual Woman of Wisdom Conference. 
Join the fabulous presenters from around the country on February 16th through the 20th. If you believe in raising the feminine spirit and transforming our world, then this conference is for you. Get your tickets now. One day and full weekend passes are available. For more information about presenters and tickets, visit womanofwisdom.org. That's womanofwisdom.org. There are so many resources out there for meditation. But did you know that Atana's Heart Earth Healing Meditation is available for you for free? Yes, that's right. You can receive this free healing meditation today from Atana Vadili. All you need to do is visit his website, atanamethod.com. That's A-T-A-A-N-A method.com and sign up. You will receive your free meditation instantly. That's atanamethod.com. Welcome back to Voices of Women. I'm Chris Stainis, and now I have with me Dijean Farrar. Dijean is an author, guest speaker, nurse, actor, model, and is an advocate for the prevention of sexual abuse and an active supporter of survivors. Dijean's stirring memoir, Not My Secret to Keep, shares her personal journey from hate, shame, and fear to acceptance, healing, and self-love. And she's giving a workshop on Saturday, February 18th. It's called The Road to Healing. So welcome, Dijean. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, we're great to have you at the conference. Um, first, let's start with your story, how you came to write your memoir, Not My Secret to Keep, and and what that is about. So how did I come to write Not My Secret to Keep? I think I basically spent years looking for a book like this. I had longed to read someone's story that was similar to mine. I wanted to understand what I was going through. I guess I was searching for validation for my feelings and experiences. And during my search for the book, after reading probably about 100 books, it seems, I came across this quote from Toni Morrison. And it was, um, if there's a book you really want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. And her quote actually inspired me to set out to write the book that I believed would be truly helpful for survivors because it's, it's a difficult sort of situation to tell such an intimate story, but knowing the validation that it could provide for others somehow made it a little easier. And I think I've always struggled a bit to make sense of my experiences and in telling my story sort of helped me put that struggle to rest, um, knowing that I was helping others possibly And I think what I learned most from that process of writing it is that if I could let the story go and thus take no ownership in what happened to me, that it would allow me to solely place the responsibility on the abusers. And I I think that's like one of the ultimate transitions or gifts for a survivor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's to acknowledge because a lot of times the uh, person who has been abused takes on the, um, um, the blame, like they caused guilt, it, all the, all the, the guilt. Yes. And, um, and I would imagine in writing the book, like you probably, you went through a healing, um, uh, a whole healing phase before you wrote the book in order to be able to write the book. But I would imagine well, I there was even a deeper level, <laughs> probably even being a deeper level of healing in writing it, even getting to a deeper level, because in writing that, I, I always said, when you share your stories, that releases the, the shame and the guilt and mm-hmm. fears. Mm-hmm. And so you probably um, had even a deeper level of healing with writing the book, don't you think? Yeah. I, and I so appreciate you saying the key thing is you ha- must have done your healing and stuff before, because so many people will say, oh, I bet it was cathartic or... Um, this helps you to heal. And I was like, well, it was like the icing on the cake. And so I just really appreciate you saying that part of it because, yeah, it's helpful, the whole process, but I definitely had to be grounded where I was before taking on that task of writing it. So. Oh, yeah. I don't think you could have written it still in a, in a, where you haven't reached a certain level of healing. Yes, yes. For sure, for sure. Um, so, so share a little bit of that, how you work through your own experience of trauma and, and getting to a place of healing. You call it the road to healing. 
Yeah, and it's 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 very interesting because like what I do in the book, I I have the first part of the book which I refer to as my journey, and it follows my journey through the difficult times, starting with unfortunately I was at Ground Zero on September the 11th, and that I think was a big trigger and just blew off my facade, let's just say. And then I really dealt with the post-traumatic stress from that. Then that brought up the post-traumatic stress from my childhood, which I was always aware of, but just put aside in a little package not to deal with. And so I think the stress and all and following the, the triggered memories of the nine years of sexual abuse that I experienced as a child... So it sort of tells that story of the work that I did step by step, three steps forward, two steps back, five steps forward, three steps back until I made it down that road. Um, The second part of the book I call Transforming the Journey, and it's the part that I say is for survivors or our families, our loved ones, the communities we live in, the communities that serve survivors, because it contains, I think, more of the information to help one understand what the healing process looks like for those affected with all types of trauma, um, those suffering PTSD, um, sexual abuse, uh, war, veterans, um, and it's just more of a resources guide to help others through their healing process. Yeah. 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 So what? So let's talk about healing. You know what? What is that? What does that mean to you? Healing. Ooh, that's a big word. <laughs> <laughs> so healing, it to me, it looks or feels like that you're not just surviving, but you're actually thriving. And for example, a survivor may be someone that's just in that existence mode of living day to day. Um, Some examples might be you choose the path of least resistance or someone finding excuses when something goes wrong, like quickly to blame others as opposed to looking within. Um, Someone frightened by the whole idea of change or just even being afraid to speak your mind because you're afraid that someone may disagree with you. And on the other hand, thriving is someone who's engaged, who's active in their life, who has connected with a a purpose in their life, feels that vitality. Um, Something as simple could be like just finding balance within your own life, nurturing yourself in terms of eating healthy meals, getting adequate sleep, getting appropriate exercise, and let's not forget most important to play and have fun and laugh just that you're connected to that vibrancy in life there. And I think some of the ways to encourage that are listening to messages that inspire you, podcasts, interviews, reading your favorite quotes, utilizing like a daily affirmation, developing a vision board, um, attending classes or conferences such as the upcoming Women of Wisdom Conference, um, I think those are all of those things on that road to healing. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that brings, I was just going to ask, you know, how, how do you help people, you know, that movement to get them to move from surviving to thriving? Because you do a yeah. lot of work with supporting um, survivors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that, that's the whole thing with, I think, those, those difficult times, like when, I think the biggest thing is, realizing you're not in control as much as you might want to be in control. And there's just those things of of like trust, um, the belief that you can get through it, faith, the energy that carries you through um, patience, that to just believe and allow to let that difficulty pass as gently as possible and the the willingness, like you've got to be willing to do what you thought you couldn't do, in essence, being open to that change. Um, and I think a big part is just acknowledging, like looking at where you're at, looking at what you've been avoiding, 
and looking at what you feel may be standing in the way. I think those are some of the beginning tools that you sort of need. And then surrender, which is a big one, that it's not like giving up, but more like the belief that there's something bigger and more powerful than you that is beneath it all and will lead you where you need to be at this time in your journey. Um, Yeah, no matter Mm -hmm. what the outcome will be, that you'll be okay. Yeah, having that hope you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I would imagine that you even see people, a woman who don't seek help. You know, we hear the story of, you know, the women that go back to the abuser, you know, what stops Mm -hmm. women from really seeking healing? You know, sometimes it's just, we get up tomorrow and do the same thing we did today because there's some comfort in that. Um, And I think it's, it really is. um, There's so much comfort in our routine and what we've been experiencing exposed to and what we've experienced. And a lot of times that keeps us in that circle, that cycle. And going back to some of those things I was saying about little things to get us to start moving out of that comfort zone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and reaching out, you know, um, Mm -hmm. creating a, a place where women can, you know, that's important that so in our in our society that there is, you know, places are available to go to yeah. for help so that they can see where they can go for help. And they have to take that first step of, of seeking help. Well, we're going to take another um, break and we'll come back and talk more with Dijeen Farrar. She's, um, again, giving a workshop on this, the road to healing at the conference. And so we're very excited to have her. So we'll be right back and talk more. Dr. Bree Gibbs is a fourth-generation high priestess with the knowledge to raise your vibration in conscious creation. Offering a wide variety of services from goddess light and shamanic healing seminars to private reading sessions, Bree works with you so you too can stand in your own power. Isn't it about time you took your life into your own hands? For more information about Bree's services and products, visit silvergaia.net. That's silver, G-A-I-A dot net. Chris Stainis is a spiritual leader and healer and teaches a course on how you can transform your life through a meditation and healing system that will manifest your spirit's dreams. She manifested the Women of Wisdom Conference, the Women of Wisdom book, and this radio show. And she can show you how to change your life, too. Are you ready? Visit the website and contact her at VoicesOfWomenToday.com. That's VoicesOfWomenToday.com. Sky Siegel co-hosts one of today's most popular psychic shows, Angels and Answers, with Artie Hoffman as she communicates healing messages from the spirit world. These messages can be astounding, enlightening, and life-changing. Born with the God-given talent of inner guidance and the amazing ability to heal, Sky has healed thousands of people. Schedule a reading with Sky now. Call 908-500-1474 and visit skyofangels.com. Tune in to Lucid Planet Radio with Dr. Kelly Neff. This hit show will illuminate your senses and empower you beyond your daily stressors and hardships. Renowned psychologist and author Dr. Kelly will captivate you with far-reaching topics and amazing guests as you wake to the greatest version of yourself. Learn to tap into your intuitions, think critically about our world, heal emotional and psychological wounds, and follow your passions to live your dreams. The Lucid Planet. Welcome home. Visit lucidplanetradio.com for more information. Registration is now open for the 25th Annual Woman of Wisdom Conference. Join the fabulous presenters from around the country on February 16th through the 20th. If you believe in raising the feminine spirit and transforming our world, then this conference is for you. Get your tickets now. One day and full weekend passes are available. For more information about presenters and tickets, visit womanofwisdom.org. That's womanofwisdom.org. Hi, this is Leslie Fontaine, and my show is Sheer Alchemy on TransformationTalkRadio.com. When we're bogged down with our emotions, the hardships that plague us in our relationships, at work, 
our finances, we literally can't see the higher plane where we could be operating from. Tune in to Leslie Fontaine, Share Alchemy on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Welcome back to Voices of Women. I'm Chris Stanis, and we're talking with Dijean Farrar. She's giving a workshop, The Road to Healing, at Woman Wisdom Conference. So, Dijean, um, please give your web address where people can find out more about you and learn about your book. Of course. So, it's DijeanFarrar.com, D-I-G-E-N-E-F-A-R-R-A-R.com, Dijean Farrar. Great. Okay. So we were talking about people getting help and, and, you know, what stops them from seeking help, but perhaps maybe you could share where, where you suggest people to go to get help. Um, you know, cause we need a kind of education. People need to, to learn about where they can go. Mm-hmm. And so, and the one thing I did in the, uh, at the end of my book, I gave a ton of resources um, but you, with the internet nowadays, it's wonderful what we have at our fingertips. And in every community, um, there are various agencies that will help. One really easy thing to do is to go to RAIN. I think it's R-A-I-N-N dot com. And they will tell you who in your local area um, has services for survivors you could contact the YWCA. Um, locally, King County Sexual Assault Resource Center is an excellent uh, resource. They have a crisis line. They do advocacy, therapy, and education. Another local one is Harborview Center for Sexual Assault and Traumatic Stress. Um, and they all have sliding scales uh, as well. So yeah, that those are some of my um, resources locally, and then on a national level, Rain is a good mm-hmm. one to put. And I imagine every city has those kind of um, things set up for for yes. Yes. for um, helping women who've been um, abused, had sexual abuse or assault or whatever. So, so um, one of the other roles that you take is an advocate for prevention of sexual abuse. So, what are your thoughts on how? We can, as a, I mean, I, I think this is a whole society issue, <laughs> but you know, how to prevent sexual abuse. Oh, that, and that's such a heavy one. People get so nervous. And I would say it starts with exactly what we're doing right now, having a conversation about it. It's, it's the secrecy that allows it to continue at the momentum that it continues because we're looking at one in four girls one in six boys will experience some form of sexual abuse by the age 18. And so I always start with, it's the conversations that we have with our children, simple things like teaching your child the correct name of their body parts. So when they're speaking with someone about something that may have happened, there is no doubt what they're saying, that they're using the exact words. It's about when we drop our children off at child care centers that we do pop-up surprise visits that we investigate before, that we establish a bond with our children early on, that you will be believed, you can tell me anything, and, and listen, 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 and let your children know that these are trusted adults like an aunt or uncle that you know you have a good open rapport with but that your child you always believe your child I just think that's a foundation that we need to start then there's a whole nother level of what's done in schools churches and uh, approaches to that like one of my favorite organizations is committee for children they're a, a agency nonprofit that does educational programs to promote social and emotional skills with children, as well as prevent bullying and sexual abuse. 
So programs like that that work with our teachers and our schools, work with our parents to shore up our societies. So as to, I don't know, I just think that shoring up, I think that's the start. And because it's just so prevalent, like I said, with the numbers from earlier. Yeah. Yeah, and I wonder if we're seeing any improvement in those numbers because we certainly have heard the statistics. And I think what's going on is exposure because, you know, the Internet helps and the, the mm-hmm. there's a lot more exposure about it. And and then that means people can't hide. And, and, and yeah. we have to stop, you know, because, well, there's that, that tendency that you don't want to believe a child say something bad about an uncle or your brother or somebody who, right. you know, and, right. and you don't want to, you're blinded. You, you don't want to believe that. And then to not believe a child, what they're saying, you know, so what you're saying is very important. And um, yeah, it's just, it's so critical to be on guard for this, to keep our eyes out open for when we see things. Like we had um, an incident at my house because I'm right across from a schoolyard and there was um, a man sitting in a truck uh, and, and my and I, I was leaving in my car, and I thought there's something strange about this. And I came back; he was still there. And I had a friend of mine was working in the yard, and he had noticed. And so I called the cops, and um, yeah. and and they called the school right away. So there was somebody at the gate, and I guess it wasn't even the first day he did this. And even with every even even with everybody there watching him, he was still watching the kids. Wow. He didn't leave, you know. And it was yeah. just it was very uncomfortable. But you know, I just felt like I have to call. No, and that's I what we need to do. Anything you. suspicious. I you for that. Yeah. Anything suspicious. You know, he who knows what he was doing there. I, I don't know. I have no idea, yeah, but it just yeah. was too and it suspicious. It doesn't even matter, but no. you saw something that didn't add up, and I'm glad that you did what you didn't. And people need to be comfortable doing that. When you see something, say something. Yes, and even if it proves wrong, at least, you know, he, at least you tried. <laughs> tried. And because if it wasn't, if you weren't wrong, you know, and a lot of times our gut, my gut was just saying, even when I drove off, seeing him there, I just, I, my gut said, and when I was still there, when I got back, I just knew there's something not right here. There's something, you know, because people don't just sit in the cars in front of my house. Right. Sit there. So anyway, it's, you know, so that's, it's important for us to realize, to, to realize our power in that, to be yeah. witnesses, to watch out for um, things that might seem off or abusive to us and to to right. you know if you suspect a friend of yours is being abused by her husband and you know there's a lot of fear they don't want to you know women don't want to talk there's so much shame they're not going to share it right. not gonna and, let and, and you're right with the shame that's why my book was titled not my secret to keep because it is not the survivor's secret to keep it's the abusers and being comfortable as you say if you see a friend or something going through that you feel comfortable to reach out and say something or give them a book such as mine to help them, you know, just say, I hear you, I see you. And sometimes that's all that's needed to start that walk down that road. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'll thank you so much for the work that you're doing and, um, and, I hope you feel supported in that. And I know you're doing a lot of volunteer work and, and, and helping women to go to thriving. That's what we want. We want women to, yes. to thrive. And now there's just women, men. Are, there's a men who've been abused too. Yeah, so well. yeah. yes, yeah. yes. So everybody check out the workshop she's giving on Saturday, February 18th, uh, The Road to Healing. It will be a talking circle. It's actually a drop-in, um, you know, very reasonably priced one-hour uh, discussion time. Um, so it'd be a great place if you are uh, needing um, some healing or know someone who needs healing to come on Saturday, February 18th. So thank you so much, Dijean, for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. Yes. Yeah, so everybody check out the workshops we talked about today. We have racism and whiteness in our backyard on Sunday, February 19th and the road to healing on, on Saturday, February 18th. Just check it all out on the website, womanofwisdom.org. So I'm Chris Stainson, the founder of Women of Wisdom. It's our 25th year. So it's February 16th to the 20th. Uh, today is our last day for some early birds for, for our featured guests. So you want to check that out and, and we're a conference that you can even drop in. You can just show up and 
come hang out at the, um, we have a tea area, we have an art show, a woman's art show, we have a goddess market, we call it a goddess market, a marketplace of local vendors who handmade, make their uh, arts and crafts, and we also have a healing temple. You can um, arrange for, to um, have a healing or a, a intuitive um, reading by somebody. Um, and anyway, it's just a great place to come hang out and also check out the workshops. So go to womanofwisdom.org and check out my book, which is the story of Woman of Wisdom. Woman of Wisdom, Empowering the Dreams and Spirit of Women. It's got lots of stories, art, poetry, talks from some of our great speakers we've had over the years, over the past 24 years. And you can read about the book at, at um, on our products page at womanofwisdom.org. Well, we're at the end of our show, so I am um, wish everybody a great weekend, and we'll be back next week with more Woman of Wisdom presenters. You've been listening to Voices of Women with Chris Stanis. Tune in each Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time for Voices of Women Today, radio with Chris Stanis.